Welcome to Environmental Law Explored, a podcast series. The podcast of the American Bar Association section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. SEER is a member organization whose mission is to foster the success of a diverse community of environmental, energy, and resources lawyers, advisors, law students, and decision makers, and provide a premier forum for the exchange of ideas and information. This is the look back at 50 years of EPA, a limited podcast series where we interview practitioners in the development of environmental law and EPA. Today, we have Mr. Walter Mugden here on the podcast. He is the Deputy Regional Administrator of EPA Region 2. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and talk to us today. As you know, this podcast really focuses on accomplishments and developments in the field of environmental law. Specifically, we are celebrating EPA's 50-year anniversary. So tell us how you got into the field of environmental law. As a child, I had always wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know why, but I, I did. And as I grew a little older, I didn't know what kind of law I wanted to practice. Um, and I got to college in 1968, back in the dark ages. Uh, but as, as you know, the 1960s, of course, was an era of tremendous uh, civil engagement as also civil unrest. Uh, it was the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and the gay rights movement all kind of really uh, took off in, in that decade. Uh, and as a, as a young person, I was affected by all of that. I got to college, and uh, when I was a sophomore, it was uh, in 19, 1970, a, a friend of mine who was a junior was organizing that something that was quaintly called a teach-in about environmental law, and it was going to be part of the celebration of the first Earth Day in 1970, on April 22nd of 1970. And uh, I said to my friend, so what is environmental law? And he said, oh, I don't know, it's, you know, lawyers who defend nature and things like, and, and get rid of pollution. And I said, uh, okay, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I had this little epiphany at that moment. Um, I had always been interested in the outdoors. I grew up in New York City, but in the outskirts of New York City and always went for hiking with my parents and things like that, was, enjoyed the outdoors. So for me, that was a uh, connection was through nature, but also as a child, I had asthma at a time when it was relatively rare. Nowadays, every, every other kid has asthma. When I was a kid, relatively few had asthma. And I knew instinctively that air pollution made it worse. So I had a personal connection with it as well, but that was really how I got into the field. I was at the University of Michigan as an undergraduate and the professor who was going to be giving this speech at the uh, first Earth Day or this talk, as a fellow named Joseph Sachs, S-A-X. He was one of the grandfathers of environmental law in the United States. At a time when few law school, I ended up going to law school in 19, starting in 1972, and at a time when few law schools had an environmental law course at all, or if they had one, they only had one. Uh, University of Michigan actually had three. And that, so I went to the University of Michigan Law School as well and took all three of those courses. So I was exactly on doing what I, what I hope to do. <laughs> and in my third year of law school, I sent out, I don't know, 170 letters of application to every state and federal environmental agency and, <laughs> uh, and to a bunch of um, foundations that did environmental work and all the environmental organizations. And uh, of those 170 letters of application, I think I got four interviews and got two and a half job offers. But among those was the one that I most wanted, which was to work for EPA and to come back to the New York area and work for EPA in New York. So uh, it was a perfect opportunity for me. I was, I, I was very, very lucky to get the job that I most wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. What made you ultimately choose to work at EPA? It was just your, your dream job. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, it's interesting. Joseph Sachs, who was my environmental law professor at Michigan, he actually had a, a different belief from that which guided me. His belief was that if the United States were to create bureaucracies to do environmental protection, the bureaucracies would quickly get co-opted by the entities they were supposed to be regulating. Uh, and he used as an example what had happened to uh, uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was supposed to regulate the railroads back uh, 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, whatever it was, 120 years ago, and 
they regulated railroads, but the railroads essentially co-opted the, uh, the uh, agency and turned it into their own engine for making sure that prices were rigged and so on. I didn't necessarily believe that. I've always been inclined towards I, I, the idea of working for the government attracted me. And in the event, I disagree. I don't think that he was right in his theory. He, he had a different approach to how environmental protection should be done through the courts by creating an environmental bill of rights in state and federal government. Ultimately, the regulatory structure that I think the United States and most every state has adopted has worked reasonably well. And I think the difference between the environmental regulatory agencies and the other examples of a co-opted regulatory agency that Professor Sachs was, was looking at, the difference is that we had what I might call a left flank not only were we regulating industries, that would be our, if you want to call it that way, our right flank, uh, and they would be tugging us to be uh, maybe less protective or less aggressive in regulation. But we had a very, very active right flank, uh, left flank with all the environmental organizations out there, uh, the CR clubs and the Friends of the Earth and the NRDC and the EDFs uh, of the world. And they created a counterbalance, which tugged the other direction. And I think as a consequence of that, we may have been less some people would probably disagree with this, but I feel that we, we weren't co-opted in the way that some of the other regulatory agencies that, that Sachs was, uh, was pointing to may have been more co-opted. So I think it's been critical mm -hmm. to us for, throughout this entire 50 years. It's been absolutely essential that we've had, we've gotten sued by both sides of the, of the aisle on a, on a regular basis, and I think that's a good thing. Right, you're right in the middle. Well, I know some people have very strong feelings both ways about EPA. Tell me about the reactions you got whenever you you decided to go work for EPA. Well, I got nothing but positive reactions from my family. My father was his only concern was that he thought I would find the bureaucracy of any government agency to be stultifying and to be oppressive. Mm. So it wasn't. <laughs> I joined EPA. EPA <laughs> I joined EPA early on, and of course it was a young agency and therefore less bureaucratic than it is today. It was a little bit more uh, wild and woolly <laughs> than than it is today. We, mm -hmm. we and a big another big difference. Uh, this was probably relevant in other contexts as well. Is that when EPA was set up uh, under the first administrator, Bill Ruckelshaus, the the ten regional offices of EPA were given an extraordinary amount of authority and even autonomy. But let's say authority more so than was typical of other federal agencies in terms of their respective regional offices. So, and that's, I think that's even still true today, that the EPA regional offices tend to have more authority and more responsibility uh, and more independence, if you want to use that word, than is true for many other federal agencies with respect to their local or regional offices. So I was in a regional office. That's where the rubber meets the road. I wanted to be in the implementation field more than I wanted to be in the policy making arena. Uh, so the policy making is done more at headquarters. The implementation was done in the regions. Uh, that was what attracted me was to actually be handling specific cases and achieving specific outcomes and results with specific facilities or entities. Uh, and um, I've never looked back. I have, uh, you know, I've had a lot of interaction with the headquarters office, obviously, over the years. I, I've done a, I did a detail once uh, in headquarters for a period of time. Uh, and while I respect uh, very much the work that they do, and it's of course absolutely essential, uh, my heart has always been with the implementation side of the of the arena, of the uh, equation, and that's that takes place in the regional offices to a very large extent uh, within EPA. I got great support from my family. Uh, my, my I've gotten fantastic support from my then my then girlfriend, now wife of uh, of uh, 48 years. <laughs> uh, nothing but positive support. Almost almost 50. Yeah. <laughs> almost 50. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, so her since 1972, since uh, just before I went to law school, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. I read that you joined EPA in 1975. I mean, I know you obviously have a lot of history with EPA, but can you just sort of walk us through sure. your various roles over the years? Yeah, I'll give a, a quick snapshot, and then I'll maybe focus a little bit more on what I did early on. So I started out as a staff attorney in the enforcement units, and the one I was in was in the air pollution enforcement group. I stayed as an attorney for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, I became a supervisory attorney in 1981 for a, a unit that handled the air, Clean Air Act, 
RECRA, TASCA, uh, and FIFRA, and the new CERCLA statute. So I <laughs> had one, one unit that handled all five of those statutes with about six attorneys. <laughs> Obviously, we've grown tremendously since then, and we separated out into separate units that handled all the different things. But that was my first supervisory job uh, in due course mm -hmm. by 1985. So after I'd been there for only 10 years, uh, I became the deputy regional counsel, meaning that I was the second in command within the legal office. Uh, by that time, the legal office had uh, grown to about 80 people altogether. So it had grown very, it had more than doubled in size in, in about that 10 year period. And then uh, in 1996, I became, I was very fortunate to get the job that I had most aspired to and that I figured would be the last job I would hold in the, in the agency. And that was as regional counsel. So that was the chief lawyer, the senior lawyer for the regional office. Uh, I was happy as a clam in that job. And then um, in 2002, well, actually 1999, I was asked to do a, a temporary detail as the enforcement division director that was managing the inspectors who do the enforcement field work. I did that for a while, had a great time, but came back to where I expected to come back to, which was the legal office. And then in 2002, I was asked to do a temporary detail in yet a different, what we call a program office within the region. Uh, it was an office that handled the air, water, and RECRA programs and the environmental review programs within the regional office. Uh, and I said, well, it's not really my wheelhouse, but uh, for the six months that was being projected, I would, I would take that temporary detail. Uh, it ended up that it was a six year assignment <laughs> and I, I ended up enjoying it tremendously. Uh, and then I was asked again in 2008 to become the Superfund division director. Again, that's the program division of the engineers and scientists and so forth who actually manage the Superfund program. Uh, I had had Superfund as a specialty of mine when I was in the legal office. Uh, I really grew up with the Superfund program. I was, as I said, I was heading up the unit that, that handled it from the time of its inception. Uh, so I had a great fondness for the Superfund program and I now was heading up the technical side of that, which was fantastically fun because now I was actually running the cleanups or my staff were, my colleagues were. So I figured, all right, that's the, the job I'll stay with for the rest of my career. <laughs> and then, in 2017, I was asked to become the, to, to take a detail as deputy regional administrator and ultimately to stay in that role as deputy regional administrator. And while it's a less enjoyable and interesting job than the ones I've had previously, uh, it's a very, very important one and somebody's got to do it. So <laughs> I accept it and that's, I, I presume that'll be, uh, in fact, the final job in my career. <laughs> right, right. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah. Well, when you first started at EPA, I believe you said the, one of the first things you worked on was the elimination of lead from motor vehicle gasoline. Exactly right. I started with the agency in August of 1975. And just in 1975, an EPA regulation had gone into effect just around that time, which required every gas station in the United States that was bigger than a certain minimal size to sell unleaded gasoline when in fact, by that, up until that time, most gas stations had, and most of the gas sold in the US for automobiles was leaded gasoline and had been so since the 1920s or 30s. Uh, lead was introduced into gasoline in the 20s and 30s as a way of reducing knock, which is a problem in the engines. Uh, there are other ways of reducing knock, but they are more expensive or they were more expensive. Uh, and so most gasoline that was sold in the US had lead in it. and in retrospect, this was the big, one of the biggest public health threats that, that the United States and the world at large was facing. The initial regulation that EPA enacted to require the sale of unleaded gasoline wasn't expressly for the purpose of reducing lead emissions in the atmosphere. Its original intent was because as of the 1975 automobile model year, a much more stringent set of uh, pollution control standards, emission limits for the automobiles had come into effect in 75. Prior to that time, cars were able to achieve the national emission control standards by doing some kind of fiddling around with the way the engine was configured. Mm -hmm. But for the new standards that went into effect in, 70, in the 75 model year, the only way to achieve those standards was by use of a catalytic, the catalytic converter. And 
this has been one of the really truly great success stories on the air pollution side of the house because the catalytic converter enabled a dramatic reduction in automobile emissions. However, it required unleaded gasoline. Leaded gasoline would cause the catalyst to get fouled and to fail. So in order to enable these new cars that were rolling off the assembly line in 75 to function properly, they could only use unleaded gasoline and every larger ga every gas station above a minimal size in the country had to, uh, had to sell it. And it was our job to enforce this brand new regulation by A, ensuring that, uh, that that gas stations of the appropriate size were in fact selling unleaded gasoline, and arguably much more importantly, that the, the unleaded gas they were selling was, was meeting the specifications, wasn't being adulterated, wasn't being mixed with the leaded gasoline. And so we actually had inspectors who went out into the field, they went to gas stations, they took samples of the nominally unleaded gas, brought it back to the lab, checked to ensure that it actually didn't have more lead in it that was, that was permitted, and when there was a violation, we took action against the, uh, the gas station or the gas company. And so that was the first program that I was assigned to, or one of the first programs I was assigned to as a you know, straight out of law school, uh, uh, new, new young employee. In later years, the agency, it takes about 10 years for, for the car fleet to turn over. So that regulation in order to protect new catalytic converters went into effect in 75. By the mid eighties, most cars had catalytic converters because most cars by that time were the newer versions that had these converters. By that time, it wasn't that important to have unleaded gasoline on the market anymore. And so EPA and Congress ultimately turned their attention to the underlying problem of leaded gasoline, which is the major public health problem that putting all this lead into the air okay. is a horribly bad idea. And so eventually EPA regulations and eliminated leaded gasoline from almost all applications in the United States. There's still a very, very few minor applications <clears throat> where it's allowed to be used, but arguably this was one of the most important public health uh, improvements that has ever been caused through government regulation. And in fact, I just happened to be looking back at some notes that I had a few years ago. Uh, you know, it was fashionable to say, what are the top 10 greatest public health improvements <clears throat> of all time, or, or at least in the last couple of centuries? And the elimination of, unleaded, of leaded gasoline uh, is in most of these lists would rank up there within the top one or two or three actions that we took. And it's been a huge... Yeah, yeah, that's... There's, there's been a gargantuan, an enormous decline. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but a huge decline in the average blood lead levels of children in the United States across all socioeconomic classes. Now, it is still true that uh, children growing up in densely populated urban areas, often minority areas, uh, they tend to have more sources of lead still around them, for example, lead paint on older housing stock. Okay. But across all socioeconomic uh, classes and across all geographic areas in the United States, the blood, the average blood lead levels in children have decreased hugely. Uh, it's like a 95% or better decrease in this period of time. And uh, we still have a ways to go. We, no lead is safe. There is no level right, of lead that right. is safe. But this this is a tremendous success story that uh, I was just coincidentally involved in at the beginning. I didn't even realize how important what I was doing was. It just seemed like I was protecting catalytic converters, but didn't realize that that as a side benefit, we were also just getting lead out of the air. Right, right. I had read that between 1980 and 2014, the levels of lead in the air decreased by 98%, which is... Right. I mean, yeah, huge. And I, I was going to ask if you realize, like, how, just how important this would be whenever you first started. I mean, nope. it seems like a <laughs> I mean, pretty, I knew, pretty important first assignment. Like, <laughs> right. And I, 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 of course, realized that it was critical to the success of the catalytic converter, which was critical to the success <laughs> right. of the pollution control equipment on cars. And I did, I did realize that cars were the major source of air pollution in many urban areas and throughout in the United okay. States. They were certainly a major source. Uh, you know, they, they by now remain the major source of, of traditional air pollution. But um, I didn't realize the other public health impacts of lead in the air. Uh, that dawned on me over, over the years as I learned more, but it, it, it wasn't apparent to me when I started out. So. <laughs> 
Right. And I mean, this is obviously a, a multi-year project. How do you think this effort was perceived at the time by the public? Well, I think that we were fortunate in the late in the, in the late sixties and it, and throughout the seventies and unto into certainly the early eighties, we were fortunate to have really a tremendously strong and bipartisan support for robust environmental regulation. Uh, it, it is you know in, it's hard for people nowadays to recognize how strongly bipartisan the support really was. Now it doesn't mean that there was unanimity. There there never was. It doesn't mean that there weren't partisan differences or differences uh, you know in different parts of the country. But there was really a, a tremendously enthusiastic, broad-based support for strong environmental regulation. And it came to the fact that that there was such obvious and in and really horrific environmental pollution. I mean, when you have, you know, the iconic things like uh, uh, rivers burning, uh, the river in Ohio that burned regularly, that was a sort of an iconic thing. We had uh, air pollution episodes in major cities that actually caused people to drop dead. It, it was, and the water was was foul. I remember that in 1971 or two or, th I think, yeah, maybe 72 or three, one of these brand new things called an environmental impact statement was written for another big project I ended up working on. This environmental impact statement was written for a proposed interstate highway segment that was going to be built on the west side of, the, of, of Manhattan, of the lower, lower portion of Manhattan. And it was going to uh, be this mega project called the Westway. And it was going to be built in landfill that was going to extend into the Hudson River. 650 feet from the shore of, from the existing shore of Manhattan, 650 feet, a tenth of the way across to New Jersey, uh, would be filled in of the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And so there was this brand new thing called NEPA, the statute NEPA that created uh, the environmental impact statement. Uh, people didn't really know how powerful that was going to end up being. It was just looked on initially, oh, okay, it's another check box to be checked. Turned out to be enormously powerful. The environmental impact statement for this Westway Highway in 1972 or 73 correctly characterized the Hudson River as it came past New York City as a biological wasteland. And this was uh, evident to people all over the country as well, that the waters all over the place were being heavily contaminated, fish were disappearing, dying, were inedible. Within 10 years, that impact statement had to be rewritten in a fundamental way because suddenly the area was teeming with fish. Now the fish were still contaminated with PCBs and other problems, but the, uh, the amount of fish was suddenly en enormous. The real reason was that the Clean Water Act uh, of 1972 created a huge fund of money and a regulatory structure that required toxic chemicals to stop being discharged or to be tremendously reduced in their discharge into the waters. And it required sewage treatment from localities all around the country who had previously just been dumping their sewage raw into the waters. This, I bring up this story because I was also coincidentally one of my other, my first really, really huge big project that I was involved in as a lawyer was also very extraordinary from a bureaucratic point of view, which I can mention in a moment, but from a substantive point of view, it was EPA taking an aggressive legal position against the construction of this highway, which was being promoted by the Federal Highway Administration, a sister agency, and being promoted by the New York State Department of Transportation, you know, an agency of our partner state. So we were there objecting to something that our other partners were seeking to promote, and the city of New York was also seeking to promote it. So it was very unusual that we were allowed to do this. It wouldn't happen today, and uh, and we did. And I was I was a state administrative proceeding to which EPA Region Two became a party opponent. So we injected ourselves as an as a party in a state administrative proceeding, in which a creature of the state was the proponent the highway uh -huh. authority and environmental aid entities and local environmental groups were the o opponents and we jumped in as an opponent as well so it was an extraordinarily unusual thing and we ended up taking a lot of political flack for it because at that time most of the elected politicians were for this highway the hearing went on for three years amassed 80,000 pages of transcript uh, i was the attorney in in the years two and three i wasn't the attorney in year one uh, the attorney in year one went on to other things. We moved out of EPA. My boss asked me to take over the case. 
I said, I really don't want to. It's a loser. I don't really care. It's not very important. I don't like it. He said, take the file home and read it. I took the file home for a weekend and read it and came back and said, okay, I'll handle this one. I love it. Uh, this is really important. And it was really important. Yeah. And it ended up, uh, the, the highway never got built. And ultimately, the $2 billion that at that time it was going to cost were able to be converted by the city and state of New York to um, about a $300 million improvement of the existing arterial roadway in that same stretch of road and $1.7 billion to bail out the New York City subway system, which at that time was collapsing from want of attention right. and want of funds. So in the city of New York, mass transit is absolutely the, the lifeblood of the city. It had been systematically drained of, of resources or, or robbed of resources for 40 years by uh, various government entities and by Robert Moses, the very famous power, master builder, uh, the power broker. And this infusion of cash was unbelievably important to the resurrection of the city subway system. So it was an amazing thing to be involved in. I was uh, able to learn at the feet or at the shoulders, or however you want to say it, of some of the most important of the first generation of environmental lawyers. And um, right. that was really pretty critical. So the, the environmental organizations that were opponents of this highway and that were in this uh, administrative proceeding, they were represented by a pair of lawyers, actually later on ended up being three or four, but the initial pair was uh, two guys named Al Butzel and Steve Cass. And they are they hold an, a uniquely important position in the history of environmental law in the United States because in the pre-EPA era, pre-government regulatory era, they brought a lawsuit in the 1960s to oppose the construction by New York's big electric utility, the Con Edison Company. Con Edison had proposed to build a pumped storage electric generating facility in an iconic part of the Hudson Highlands called Storm King Mountain. The idea was that they, during the nighttime when there was low electric demand, they would use electricity to pump water up to a reservoir high up above the Hudson River. And in times when there was high demand, they would let the water run back down and spin a generator. So pump storage is, a, is not a bad idea in principle, but it was going to completely destroy this iconic landscape up there. And as you pump the water in, you suck in a lot of fish, and then they die, and you spit them back out again. And they go through the rotors of the generator, and they die. So it's environmentally has a lot of drawbacks. And these two young attorneys took on a case for the Hudson River Fishermen's Association and some local environmental, other local environmental groups, and they won. And that was in the 1960s, before NEPA, before any uh, state NEPA analogs uh, before any of the regulatory statutes went into effect, and they won on basically common law theories, but they killed the project. And so they, they were really the, at, the, at the front leading edge of environmental law. By the time I got to know yeah. them in 1976, when I took over the Westway case, I was learning from these two guys who, who were fantastically knowledgeable. By the way, they soon hired a young associate who was my own age, who is today probably one of the widely acknowledged to be one of the top environmental lawyers in the United States, and his name is Michael Gerard. He now teaches at Columbia, um, but he was for many years with Arnold and Porter. But he started out as an associate in this boutique law firm that these two young guys, uh, Bustle and Cass, had, had uh, created. Uh, opposing me on the other side, or opposing us on the other side, representing the highway project, was a, uh, a lawyer from one of the top law firms in, in New York, and his name was Frederick A. O. Schwartz, Jr. Fritz Schwartz, F. A. O. Schwartz, Jr. Uh -huh. He was a, uh, uh -huh. the, he was the heir to the F. A. O. Schwartz uh, uh, fortune. He was a fabulous guy. He was um, with Cravath, Swain, and Moore. I think he may still be. I'm not sure, but certainly he was one of the top law firms in New York. You know, in New York and elsewhere. He later on went on to become the corporation counsel for the city of New York, which is like the attorney general for the city of New York. But he was uh, my lead opponent in this Westway case. And boy, did I learn a huge amount from him. But he understood law and he understood environmental law extraordinarily well. It wasn't his main event. Environmental law was not his main event, but, but he certainly understood it. And so I was learning from some of the best through this Westway case. And uh, it really had a profound impact on my career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you remember any particular obstacles or struggles during that time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there were always obstacles and struggles. <laughs> So, um, uh, I mean, I remember at one particular point on a matter, a different kind of a matter where 
I was looking to try and advance an enforcement action. I can't even remember what it was, but the regional administrator at the time of EPA Region 2, who was himself a terrific guy, a really fabulous guy, and uh, his name was Gerald Hansler. He was a, uh, a, a uniformed member of the Public Health Service, and yet here he was in this political position of a, uh, of a regional administrator. Uh, he had family connections uh, into the political world, which is why he was appointed, but uh, he was certainly a, a consummate uh, a professional in the public health field. And uh, some, for some reason, some enforcement action that I was involved in, I can't even remember what it was, he nixed it. He put the kibosh on it, or he didn't like what we were doing or something. I can't remember what it was. And this infuriated me. <laughs> I was a young, you know, young guy. I said, oh, what's what's going on here? So I, I had my first, you know, discussion with the regional administrator. He turned out to be a really guy, smart guy, and a really good guy. And you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I ultimately recognized that he had a pretty good point. And it wasn't such a big issue anyhow. And and ultimately, we worked our way through it. But you know, they were all. It's a bureaucracy, and uh, young, young attorneys who are like myself, who wanted to have the sense of a lot of independence, uh, sometimes chafed at having being working in a bureaucracy. That was what my father had predicted that I would, <laughs> I would do. I would chafe at that. <laughs> so what I did is I ultimately recognized that one of the most important things for any bureaucrat to learn is not only the law and the, you know, the technology and so forth of, of environmental protection, environmental management, but you also have to learn how to manage the bureaucracy. And you have to recognize that sometimes or often the shortest distance between any two points in the bureaucracy is not a straight line. It's often a zigzag. And you got to learn how to, you have to, that's part of the, part of the job that you have to learn. Just like you learn all the other parts of the job, you have to learn how to manage the bureaucracy. And I found that I was, I had the good fortune of being reasonably good at it. Uh, and, um, and it didn't drive me crazy. Sometimes some people, it just drives them crazy. So I would see it as a puzzle or as a challenge and, uh, rather than as a constant irritant. So there was something in my makeup that allowed me to, to, to tolerate and, and actually, I think, you know, ultimately be reasonably successful in the bureaucracy. And that was an important skill set to acquire. And I've used it, you know, obviously, throughout my whole career. I, I suppose if I hadn't acquired some of that, I wouldn't have gotten promotions that I got. And it, it's important that people, if you, don't, if you don't care for that, that's fine. Uh, there's other ways you can be very productive and very work very, very constructively in the bureaucracy, even if you don't want to do that kind of bureaucratic infighting. But I've found that it is an important skill set for me, and that I've tried to use it to the best of my ability. And the consequence, the result is that although I've had lots of frustrations and lots of instances over many years where I've disagreed with maybe the current political poll administration, or I've disagreed with a decision being made on a particular matter, I have never uh -huh. in 45 years had to go to bed at night and feel bad about what I was doing. I've okay. never in 45 yeah. years had to do something that I thought was wrong. I have maybe been prevented to do or stopped from doing things that I thought were important or necessary or, or, or helpful but I've never been forced to do something that I thought was wrong. To have had a career of 45 years and to be able to say that, I think is, that's pretty extraordinary and has been a hugely important part of my own personal life. So right. obstacles, right. obviously, important. there have been a couple of times uh, when uh, environmental regulation has been uh, seen as being uh, more problematical or when it hasn't had the strong political support that it had in the earliest days. You know, there, there, there are pendulums that swing back and forth. When you're in the middle of a swing, if it's going the way you don't like it, it, it becomes very troubling. But it is one of these, um, I guess with the benefit of 45 years, the pendulum does tend to swing. And therefore, if you can hold on, uh, if you're unhappy with the way it's swinging in one period of time, then in another period of time, it's likely to swing in the other way. Uh, now, I'm not a great proponent of wild swings, but um, mm -hmm. nevertheless, uh, it, they do, it does go back and forth. And I've lived through quite a few of these pendulum swings. Uh, you know, we're in one, arguably we're in one right now. People would argue we might've been in one as well, the previous administration. So. It, this is a fact of life. It's the, it's the nature of the political system that we live in. Uh, and so it's helpful to have a long view and say, well, whatever it is, this too shall pass, whether it's good or bad, <laughs> it's going to, there'll be some time. Right, that right. Well, let's talk about CERCLA a little bit. I mean, enacted in 1980, it's hard to imagine a time when we didn't have CERCLA, <laughs> right. but t tell me about the development of CERCLA at EPA yeah, well. and, and your involvement. So it's the, a big topic. The, it's, it is, but I'll, I'll even bore you a little bit more with some further reflection on, on environmental law history. So the modern environmental era of law, uh, modern environmental law era starts with NEPA in 1970 and beginning of 1970. End of 1970 came the Clear Act, Clean Air Act, then in 72 came the Clean Water Act 
we had all the other laws. We had RECRA, we had TSCA, we had FIFRA being amended and updated. We had uh, EPCRA, uh, Clean the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the Ocean Dumping Act. All of these statutes were all passed in the 11, 11 year period from 1970 to 1980. And the, the end of that environmental decade that I like to call it, the last of those was CERCLA. It was on December I don't know, 12th or something like that of 1980. So uh, almost exactly 11 years after NEPA went into effect. So, and after EPA had been established, EPA opened its doors at, on the first day of 1971. So it really was a capstone. And whereas all of the other statutes were prospective in their nature, they were regulatory looking ahead and saying, from this point forward, you got to do various other things. You got to start to deal with pollution and on and on. CERCLA was enormously different because it was retrospective and said, hey, we've created messes for the last 150 years of the industrial era, uh, and those messes are, are still there today, and they've got to be cleaned up. And so I, I suggest that Superfund had as much of an impact in the way in which corporations and other entities, but particularly corporations, look at the environmental arena as all of the other laws put together. And the reason is because it suddenly became apparent in, in what was seemed to be, you know, an, almost an unconstitutional retroactive application. It isn't, and it wasn't, but that was how it was viewed. Suddenly people were being held liable for gargantuan sums of money, as they saw it, for things that they had done or their, or their corporate predecessors had done years, decades, even centuries earlier, and that were completely legal at the time they were done. And now suddenly they were being forced to spend tens of millions, millions, tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars to correct those problems. And what this said, first of all, the amounts of money were big enough so that they went right up to the top of the corporate boardroom. You know, they, these things weren't being handled by middle level managers somewhere in the, in the bowels of the corporation. They had to go right up to the top of the corporations. And what they made, what it made clear was, even if today we are complying with current regulations, if that causes environmental problems, we can be held liable for them sometime in the future, either under Superfund or under some other similar law that, that, that takes effect somewhere down the line. Therefore, it's really important for us to look at our own internal processes and how, wh what kinds of waste are we generating and how is that waste being managed? Yes, there's RECRA already that forces us to manage our hazardous waste in a certain way. Yes, TSCA forces us to manage some kind of PCB waste in certain ways. But let's look more broadly. What is going on in our, in our production processes and how is that being managed when it leaves our property? because we could be liable for all of that for, for huge amounts of money. And so it caused, I believe, a complete change in corporate attitudes about the environment or, or an, a very significant change. I won't say complete, but a very significant one. Also importantly for EPA and for environmental law and environmental consultancy, once that was perceived by, by the big corporations, once Superfund was understood in the early 80s, 83, 84, 85, they suddenly realized that they needed to have better better trained lawyers, people who understood environmental law and specifically Superfund, and they needed an engineering and technical and scientific consultants who did the same. And where did they find those? They found those with the young people that were being hired by EPA to staff up this brand new Superfund law. We were doubling in size, to staff, or almost doubling in size, to staff up for the Superfund law. And after a year or two, those people became prime targets for the headhunters and every major law firm in the country, previously environmental law had been a boutique kind of thing. A few major law firms had maybe a couple of people sitting in a back room somewhere who did environmental law. There were a number of boutique law firms that did nothing but, but very few. Suddenly every major law firm and every major engineer and consulting firm had to have people with environmental specialties and environmental experience. And they wanted people who had been with EPA or in some cases with state and agencies for maybe one 18 months or 24 months, maybe a maximum of 36 months. Beyond that, they thought we were probably damaged goods. But as a consequence, between 1985 and 1990, or 1984 and 1990, we in the EPA did this vast amount of hiring, and yet people were just leaving us and leaving us and leaving us. In the calendar year 1990, my staff of 80 attorneys in EPA Region 2, in calendar year 1990, among staff attorneys had an average of under two years of experience. And yet here we were handling these multi-gazillion dollar Superfund cases, as well as all of our other important air pollution and water pollution cases, with people who had this basically still wet behind the ears. It was an amazing time for, pe for, for people. Uh, it gave a huge number of opportunities for folks to 
you know, double their salary uh, overnight when they went uh, from EPA to a law firm or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was a fantastic learning opportunity because by definition, we had to let people have a lot of independence because there was only so much management you could give them. So it was an amazingly energized period of time and has had an, Im the impact is lasting because still to this day, every major law firm, every major corporate law firm really has to have an environmental practice if, if they're a full service law firm. Whenever you were involved, how did you envision sort of the impact of CERCLA? That one we knew would be big. I mean, initially we, uh, yeah. I mean, we had sites like Love Canal and, and similar and the Hudson River, you know, hugely important, high profile, controversial, uh, widely uh, attended to. People were paying attention. Communities cared. Unlike, you know, the, in the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, yes, they're enormously important from a public health point of view, probably more so than Superfund actually, but it's rare that a specific individual group of residents in a particular community are tremendously exercised. If there's, well, if there's a factory in their backyard that's spewing out air pollution, they'll get engaged. If there's a factory outside their backyard that's spewing out water pollution, they'll get engaged. But as those major air pollution and water pollution blights were being dealt with by the regulatory program, there was less and less of that obvious pollution in your backyard. There still is quite a bit of it, but there was less of it. It wasn't dark black smoke pouring out of the out of the smokestacks and it wasn't uh, uh, horribly discolored stuff pouring out of pipes into the local streams. But in Superfund, almost by definition, all of these sites are in somebody's backyard. And the mm -hmm. level of community engagement uh, and community interaction between communities and EPA in the Superfund program is like no other program in all of the, uh, that the agency administers. In the Superfund program, we literally are in people's homes. We literally are in their backyards, both literally and figuratively, all the time. And we have a tremendous amount of community interaction that, is, that far exceeds that which we have in any other program. I think that's healthy. I think it's healthy because some of that bleeds over into our other programs where we then try and do more community outreach, where we, we understand how powerful that can be. Uh, when we do work at what I might call the retail level, going into communities and saying, what are your concerns? Some of them are in our wheelhouse and some are not, but we could be a convener of influence. We could bring in other, other federal and state agencies that may be able to address some other problems that the community is facing, which are either vaguely environmental or not even environmental, but we can help uh, because we are in their communities and because we are focused now on community interaction, we can help be a convener of influence uh, for uh, that, that helps out some underprivileged and, and environmental justice communities and others like that. So all of that really flows from our Superfund experience. And uh, that, I think, has been a tremendously important. Yeah, yeah. As we're nearing the end of our time, I, I know this is a huge question, but if from your years of service with the EPA, what are you most proud of? I guess what I'm most proud of is that I've been able and I've been lucky, and a lot of it is luck, I was in the right place at the right time, and I was fortunate to get out of law school without any student debts that I had to pay off. And so I was able to very, very comfortably live on a government salary. That's not true for everybody. Therefore, I never had a financial, intense financial pressure to leave EPA. And I was able, therefore, to spend my entire career doing that, which I had always wanted to do. And as I said earlier, to always feel like on balance at the end of any given day or week or month, uh, I, I feel like I've done more positive than than, than maybe negative. Or, or things have generally been, been positive, even when I have differences of opinion with the way the agency is, is focusing on some new policy or any, things or whatever. So that's I've been very fortunate. So what I'm most proud of is the is the fact that I've been able to do this for this, such a long period of time, and um, and I've been proud of the fact that my colleagues, whether they and both administrations, I've worked you know I've worked for 12, 11 different regional administrators, both Republican and Democratic, over these years. I'm proud of the fact that I have I'm good friends with all of them and have earned the respect of all of them. So I guess that, in a way, is probably the most, the thing I'm most proud of is that I really have been able to, you know, live the bipartisan, the nonpartisan ideal of a career civil servant. And nevertheless, at the same time, I've done so without having, in my judgment, to, to have, uh, uh, you know, violated my own principles or, or anything like that. So that's, that's the thing. Now, in terms of specific matters that I've worked on and or things that I've accomplished, uh, I've, I've identified two of, one of the big ones, which was uh, the Westway uh, highway case, which I, I'm enormously proud of. And I guess uh, the other end of the book end of my career is when I was Superfund Division Director from 2008 to 2017, two of the most important and most uh, dramatic cleanup decisions were made 
in Region 2 by my colleagues and my staff and under my direction and have my signature on them. Uh, and that is the uh, Phase 2 of the Hudson River PCB Superfund site cleanup and Phase 2 or Operable Unit 2 of the Passaic River cleanup. Mm. These are two Superfund mega sites. Cleanup cost for the Hudson River that I'm alluding to was $1.7 billion. Still the most expensive single cleanup in Superfund history. And, right, yeah. And highly controversial still to this day. And, and there, there are people who feel we haven't gone far enough. And uh, nevertheless, uh, we think we, we did a good job. For a while, we were being cheered by the environmentalists for doing such a great job. And more recently, we were challenged and uh, criticized by the environmental community for not going far enough. We still think we've done the right thing and time will tell. Uh, the Passaic mm -hmm. River promises to be an even more expensive mega cleanup. Uh, that decision came out under my signature in 2016. And uh, within the next year or so is scheduled to actual cleanup work is actually supposed to start or construction of the sediment treatment facility and, and things of that sort is supposed to start within a year. So those are two things I'm enormously proud of. There's also a, a, another sediment site in New York City called Gowanus Canal. It's also a Superfund site, uh, end up costing over a billion dollars or well over a billion dollars to clean it up, probably several billion. There, there was intense political opposition from the, originally from the Michael Bloomberg New York City administration, but it's still pretty controversial and uh, Yet we've persevered and I think continue to make the right decisions for that one. Again, whether it's a Democratic or administrative or Republican administration in EPA hasn't made any difference at all. We've we've done what we felt were the right things scientifically and legally. And so those are some of the things that I'm most proud of. And I've been personally and intimately involved in each of those three that I just mentioned. Yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, I think we can all agree the world in 2020 uh, feels a little different. <laughs> Boy, <does>. what, <laughs> just a little. Uh, what do you think EPA should be focusing on right now? So we, we obviously know that one of the one of the very hot issues of the last several years has been what are called emerging contaminants, the whole class of mm -hmm. of uh, substances called PFAS, perfluorinated alkyl. Well, I don't know exactly alkaline substances is. I, I didn't get the word right co exactly correct, but it's PFAS. That includes things like PFOA, which Teflon was made out of, uh, and includes other other products that are widely used in the past and still today in various consumer products. Some of these, there's about 3,000 of these PFAS compounds. It's a huge category of, of uh, chemical class of compounds, uh, but many of them are known to be quite dangerous and toxic, even in parts per trillion levels. Um, and there's been a great deal of attention in recent years about these, this class of compounds. They've been found in drinking water supplies, often because of uh, manufacturing facilities that discharge them, or because firefighting foam for many decades has used these compounds. And so uh, okay. typically in airports and other places where it was used to fight fires or to do fire training, uh, this stuff would get into the ground and therefore into the ground water and therefore into the drinking water. So it's been a major concern. That's a, called an emerging contaminant, and we're we are actively focused on it. Again, uh, people are concerned that we're not moving quickly enough, but it is a hugely intensive effort right now throughout lots of EPA uh, parts of EPA doing a huge amount of research on it. We're doing regulatory work. Uh, so although we are a little slower than some of our state colleagues in getting the regulation, getting it regulated, uh, we are, I think, doing really good science on it. And so that when we regulate, we will be doing it with a strong, strong scientific background. Um, so that's PFAS. There's another emerging contaminant that's also of concern called 1,4-dioxane, not to be confused with dioxin. Uh, that's, again, widely used in consumer applications and in industrial applications. It's not quite as toxic, it's not understood to be quite as toxic as these PFAS compounds, but nevertheless, it is understood, understood to be toxic. And it's unfortunately more difficult to extract from drinking water sources than the PFAS compounds. So that's a, a challenge that, we're, that we and many water systems are facing and states are dealing with right now. Ethylene oxide is a chemical that is widely used as a disinfectant in manufacture and handling of medical devices. Consider how important that is right now in the pandemic era. Yeah. Yet it's a highly toxic chemical when emitted into the air. And uh, so we've got uh, a number of facilities, factories around the country that use or make ethylene oxide. 
uh, and that is a cons an emerging contaminant that we're focused on right now. Uh, again, as people may say we're not moving fast enough, but we're trying to do it in a deliberate and thoughtful way. So there's this whole this whole arena of emerging contaminants that we're focused on. That's hugely important. Lead in drinking water. We thought we had you know dealt with a lead problem <laughs> back back when I started, uh, and uh, we did to a certain to a large extent. We dealt with the lead in air problem. But we find that lead in drinking water is persisting as a major problem, especially in older urban areas where lead pipes carry the drinking water from the street to your home. So the situation in Flint, Michigan, the very, very unfortunate situation, tragic situation there, uh, and a much more fortunate and appropriate outcome in a city like Newark, which also faced a similar crisis and, and dealt with it uh, fortunately in a much more appropriate or faster way with strong support from the states and from the state of New Jersey and EPA. But it's, it's just highlighted how much of an issue lead service line replacement really needs to be. And it's a hugely expensive, even though any uh, replacing any one single lead pipe service line is not very expensive. It's a couple of thousand dollars typically, but there's so many of them that it adds up to right. tens or hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars nationwide. And so finding the money to do that uh, and finding the will and the, and the regulatory obligation to do that is a hugely important thing that we still face ahead of us. And then, of course, the one that is perhaps under the greatest level of de debate and discussion is climate change. And uh, I firmly believe that it is, I personally believe that it's an existential threat. I don't think that we have as yet uh, taken the steps that are necessary to, uh, to do what can and should be done. Uh, that's obviously a key policy question for the policy leadership of the government uh, to, to grapple with. Uh, as I said, I don't, my job has not been in the policy making arena, my job has been in the implementation arena. But I, I think that debate will remain very, very important and very high profile. It's obviously, we're seeing it uh, in political races, you know, it's, it's something that's coming up in our election races. Uh, we'll see what happens there, but it's something that is it's a threat that faces not just the United States, but everywhere in the world. Uh, and um, it, it's one that brings us very much in contact with and sometimes even now in conflict with, uh, with the, the international community. So I think trying to find um, a pathway there that is sensible and it properly addresses the threat in its, in that, that exists, I think that that's going to be important. Now, one, one thing that I think the government is doing a better, is doing a good job on, or I shouldn't say good because we have so far to go, but there is enough, there is a good deal of focus on starting to deal with not only avoiding climate change, because we know some of it is unavoidable by now, but in adapting to climate change and making more, making wise decisions about where to build. Do we build in floodplains? Do we rebuild in floodplains when houses are destroyed? It's going to be an issue that's undoubtedly going to be facing the, the poor folks uh, down in uh, Louisiana and elsewhere who are right now facing the, the, the Hurricane Laura uh, impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been an issue that came up here in New York after Hurricane Sandy. It's come up, uh, you know, after Hurricane Katrina. Do you rebuild right in the dangerous spaces? Uh, do you give those people, once again, flood insurance? That's not an EPA's direct uh, lane, but it's it's a major issue that comes from the climate change concerns of more frequent and stronger storms and uh, and the overdevelopment of our floodplains and things of that sort. So that's that, those are all issues that society at large is going to have to be grappling with for decades to come. Right. Well, my last question is very forward facing. Where do you think EPA will be in another 50 years? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the, the only thing I know imagine. about it is that yeah. as long as I've been with EPA, I guess I won't be there 50 years from now. That's one thing <laughs> that I think is pretty clear. Um, it's the next generation, yeah. Yeah, it's it's probably two generations away if you assume that each generation <laughs> yeah. is, you know, maybe 25 years. Uh, and it's not clear to me whether as an actual practical matter, whether the young people coming to EPA now, are they likely to spend an entire career with the agency the way I have? Uh, you know, I, I joined the agency when I was 23 years old. And uh, I'm still here 45 years later, so you can do the arithmetic, you can figure out that I'm 68, almost 69. Um, is that a likely model for the young people coming into the agency today? I'm delighted that we're bringing young people in. For a long time, we were in sort of perpetual hiring freezes. Uh, and uh, I, I told you how in the late 80s, we were having this incessant turnover. That all flipped with the economic recession in 1991 
uh, suddenly uh, all the law firms and the consulting firms had hired up and they didn't have room for more people. And so the folks who had come to EPA and who were still there in the 19, early 1990s were delighted to have a job. And they ended up staying, and they ended up staying for, for decades, as, as I have also done. Uh, but we have many uh, of our attorneys and engineers who have 30 and even 40 years of experience now, but now they're beginning to retire. Uh, and um, okay. unlike me, they have seen the clock ticking, and <laughs> they have said, you know, it's time to, time to enjoy my retirement. And they've moved on, and that has allowed us now to do quite a lot of hiring of young people, younger people, newer people, I should say. Not, it doesn't matter whether they're young or old, but they're new to the agency. Uh, and to bring in some uh, some new ideas and new creativity is always very healthy for an organization to have a better balance, a demographic balance. So I certainly hope that some of those folks will see this as a lifetime, uh, you know, something that they want to do for their whole career. And uh, I hope that they will bring their creativity and their thoughtfulness to continuing what I believe has been an extraordinary 50 years of accomplishments. Yeah, have we made mistakes? Sure. Have we failed to do things that we should have done? Sure. Were there things that we did halfway when we should have done full? Sure. But it is incontrovertible that that the environment is in enormously better condition today than it was 50 years ago. And EPA has been at the forefront with many, many, many partners, but we have been at the forefront of uh, making that possible. Obviously, it wouldn't have been possible without the strong bipartisan support that created all those laws. It wouldn't have been possible without all the state and local even environmental agencies, but certainly all the state environmental agencies who really carry the laboring oar for administering most of these programs. Uh, it certainly wouldn't have been true if we didn't have the strong, what I called earlier, the left flank, the environmental organizations out there who keep us accountable and who constantly are suing us and challenging us and commenting on regs and, and things of that sort and making sure that uh, as much as possible, making sure that we aren't straying too far into the into the other side of the fence. Uh, we've we've had a change, a real big change, I think, in how most corporations, most big corporations, see the environment. They they recognize that it's critical to to what they do. And yeah, they may disagree with certain actions that we're taking. They may think we're going too far, or it's too expensive, or they can't afford it, or it's not technologically possible. But on balance, they recognize their obligations. They recognize that it's important to their corporate images. Uh, to their brands, whatever else. And so that is a huge, huge, huge difference from where we were 50 years ago. And I, I think it's hard for you know people who have grown up and only come to age in, in the last few years to sort of recognize how dismal things were in the environmental arena a half a century ago. So I hope that um, with programs like your own and, and with the benefit of history, these young people who are now entering the, our environmental workforce will find the way to deal with these big, big problems that we still have facing us. And uh, what do I hope 50 years from now? I hope that we have a, a largely a renewable energy economy throughout the United States and the world. And environmental lawyers are going to be very important in trying to help make that and figure out how to get there from here. And I hope that we will have a better set of tools to evaluate the, the incredible new technologies and new chemicals that are constantly being developed. I hope we have a better set of tools for figuring out in advance whether they're good ideas or not, rather than often being reactive. In the case of PFAS, yeah, Teflon was a great idea. Uh, people loved cooking on it. Turns out, in retrospect, it wasn't such a good idea. Asbestos, <laughs> lead, lead drinking water pipes, asbestos insulation and fireproofing. The, I mean, you can get the list goes on and on and on of things that we thought were good ideas. PCBs were brilliant. They were great. They had fabulous purposes. You know, the things that they did were, were, were incredibly important. But what a bad idea in retrospect, right? So if we could figure out a better way to learn in the front end whether things are likely to be a good idea or a bad idea and take appropriate action, that I think would be my ideal vision of where we would be 50 years from now. I hope we'd be there faster, but certainly by, by, by another 50 years. Right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us and tell us about your experiences. I I mean, unless you have any other... No, no, I know. I've already taken, of, I've already taken more time. I've taken more of your time than I should have, but uh, uh, in case no, it wasn't... No, no, it's... it's yeah. In case it wasn't obvious, I'm still enthusiastic, and it's it's great to have an opportunity. It's great for me to have an opportunity to reminisce and to look back as well, because you know, in the day-to-day -day hustle, you don't know if I have a chance to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, and and we we really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our section, 
please visit our website at www.americanbar.org slash Please check where you found us for future episodes. Thank you for listening.